There we go. All right. So let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Margaret Mellinger, and I'm at Oregon State University, and I'm one of the PIs on this project, uh, co-PI. And um, we are going to be talking about um, a project that we had um, with IMLS to um, create some analytics features for Hyrax. And I want to let everyone else on the panel present uh, presenters um, introduce themselves. So let's start with Franny and go to Sarah and April after that. All right. Um, thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm Franny Gady. I'm the Director of Digital Scholarship Services at the University of Oregon and um, co-PI with uh, Margaret on the IMLS grant that helped create this project. Um, and before that, um, one of the things that kind of helped uh, germinate this idea. Um, I worked at Butler University. Um, I see a few of my former colleagues from Palmy here today and um, was very interested in the gap analysis from Haiku. And one of the major things that was on there um, was analytics. And so that kind of helped uh, you know, bring up the idea of, of wanting to work on this project. Um, and so that's kind of where uh, my interest in working on this came from. And I will pass it over to Sarah. Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Garachi, better known as Jeezy. I am a software developer at Notch 8, um, and I was super excited to work on the analytics project. And I'm hoping April is not having technical difficulties. April has joined the call, but I'm understanding that she's having a hard time connecting to audio at the moment. Oh no. So I, I guess we can mostly say that Sarah, uh, that April has um, been working on some of the web design and accessibility features within this project uh, and working as part of the Notch 8 team. So um, given, given the introductions, I guess we just need to go forward. Um, we want to express our gratitude to the IMLS for a nat national leadership grant that supported this work and much of the work was actually completed by Notch 8. So we want to also thanking the Notch 8 team. And it was a little bit bigger than the people on the call today. And we won't read all the names out, but we want to thank everybody at Notch 8 for being wonderful to work with and for um, um, working with us on this project. So to get started, um, uh, obviously analytics is built on a data source. And uh, while the majority of academic libraries use Google Analytics as a data source, there's an increasing concern about protecting the privacy of library users. So questions arise about the data that Google collects, how long they store it, how administrators can set up Google Analytics to best protect user privacy and other issues. Um, and an alternative to Google Analytics that seems to be less evil than Google at the time is uh, Matomo, uh, which offers a lot of the same features as Google Analytics, but the data it collects belongs only to the institution that is running it. So um, because of this growing concern on privacy and controlling user data, one of the basic requirements of this grant was to give Hyrax adopters a choice between the familiar Google Analytics and Matomo, which they might want to move to uh, because it can be locally hosted. It has sort of a default do not track setting, and it gives administrators more control over how long data is kept. And Sarah worked on this extensively, so we wanted to have her talk about um, some of the features and how she approached the separation of those two data sources. So the super cool thing is you can choose between either Analytics or Matomo and you'll find that they work exactly the same in the app. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, they're both integrated directly into the new Hyrax dashboard. Um, and then you can still log into your accounts as normal. So you can still go to googleanalytics.com and log into your account and access all the features as you normally would. Same for Matomo. 
One thing that I really like about Matomo is that you can self-host it. So your data stays within your organization. It's not getting sent off to somebody else's servers, which is really nice. Um, but other than that, I think you'll find them to be very similar. Um, I think Matomo has a little bit easier to use interface, uh, but Google probably still has um, a little bit more powerful reporting features. But as far as the integration into Hyrax, they're both exactly the same. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry, I went forward too fast there. I think our one back. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, hi, hi, April. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Yay. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, one of the things that uh, we st so I wanted to start with uh, on the front end. And so uh, when we're talking front end here, this isn't front end design so much as like what public users are going to see here. Um, and so this is kind of uh, sprucing up a few things that were already in place and kind of taking some of the lovely design that you're going to see from on the dashboard side um, and, and bringing that for um, public users to see. And so um, this is some of the storytelling um, that we wanted to be able to do, you know, depending on kind of what model of repository you might be following, um, whether it's a self-submission sort of thing or a, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take your stuff and deposit it for you, whether it's an institutional repository or a cultural repository. So there might be, uh, you know, any number of use cases, whether, um, you know, whether this is faculty who are going to use this kind of data for promotion and tenure and they want to check it themselves, or they might have a login where they'd be able to take advantage of some of the things that we're going to look at on the back end. So this might be something that they want to look at on the front end here. Um, you know, this might also be something that um, an administrator might check in on themselves or, you know, you might provide them a report from the back end here. So, you know, just kind of providing this here on the front end for anybody to be able to check in on um, and kind of adding a little bit of the flair that you will see on the back end here. I don't know, April, if you wanted to add anything. Um, yeah, so this was already pre-existing in place. And a part of the work that we did was just connecting it up to the analytics providers. Um, so we're really excited that we were able to get that um, contributed back hopefully soon. Um, but uh, I can go ahead and start talking about the dashboard next. All right. Part of this work was brought up with the Hyrax Analytic Working Group, and they had created the initial wireframes for this work. And one of the things that they wanted to incorporate in this design was a calendar widget. Um, so we started to develop the calendar, each calendar, each graph having its own calendar widget, but uh, we initially thought that that would be a great user experience. Um, when we were playing with the actual data, though, we we noticed that it, it was a little confusing and clunky for the user experience and decided to just use one calendar widget for the entire dashboard. So when we update that calendar widget, it updates the dates for all of the graphs on that page. Um, so that was pretty exciting to include. And up at the top there where it says customized graph reports, that'll update to show you uh, what dates um, your report going down is actually um, showing. So. That's nice as well. All right. right. And we can go on to the next slide now. All right. This has some good information on it here. Um, April, do you want to start us off? Sure. All right. So um, this was part of the user activity graph that was previously on Hyrax. Um, we also had the user summary. Um, I'm not sure if it, well, you guys are probably all familiar with Hyrax and how the user summary displays in the main block above the fold on the dashboard. We decided to take better use of the space and include that within the user activity graph, um, creating kind of like an easier, um, much more meaningful experience so that we can get an, a high overview of the graph and the user activity. Um, we also needed to add um, some, uh, usability cases, uh, we needed to include a larger text for the graph labels. Uh, we had to apply better label spacing. We had to ensure that the ARIA, ARIA labels were um, text-based for screen readers. 
um, and including a colorblind safe array of colors for all of the graphs to utilize. Um, and that's all I have to include for this beautiful graph. And on Hover, um, you can see in the screenshot here that I captured this on a particular day that it breaks down um, some of the things that you might see in a Google Analytics or Matoma report uh, without having to actually leave the site there. Um, and so we opted here for stacked bar graphs as well, rather than say pie charts or something along those lines as being a lot easier to parse. Um, so th that was something that we, we kind of um, decided fairly early on in the process as I am not a big fan of pie charts and was like, eh, can, we, can we find something else uh, to display this data here? So, um, all right. So I think that was it for our user summary here. And so um, on, the, on the other side of kind of user data, one of the other things that we knew was also really important was repository growth over time too. So we want to know how often our materials are being accessed, but we also kind of want to know how much stuff is in there as well and at what rate things are growing. And so the two items that we're tracking here are number of works and number of collections over time. Um, and so this is also for that date picker. Um, so that defaults to one month, as you can see here. Uh, well, actually, we have, a, we have a longer date here. So this is, I think, dating back to, um, I think, the start of the, of the staging server to uh, when we picked it. But um, it defaults to a single month. I, I think I wanted to get a larger spread of time so we could see, oh, hey, here's when we added all of these items. Um, so we actually had a, like, a little bump up here. But um, I think that this is an item that was particularly important to repository managers um, to kind of demonstrate like, hey, look at how well we're doing it, adding new items um, into, our, into our repository. And so here we've got um, blue is collections and black um, is number of works. And so this can kind of show periods of particular growth, um, you know, large number of works. Let's say we had, you know, kind of a big batch ingest that was maybe associated with a new collection or, you know, hey, we had a really good recruiting period associated with an institutional repository. Um, again, you know, with the idea of these are all meant to be storytelling mechanisms. And April, I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to add along though. Um, and again, with the, um, uh, with hover as well. So being able to kind of hover over each of those points to get more information. Sorry about the slides flashing around <laughs> there. I, um, my mouse was a little unhappy, I guess. <laughs> I know every time like I hit a, like your mouse wheel or something like that, and it's like, oh, we're going to play roulette with the slides here. Yeah. Let's see oh, which yeah. one we land on. Yeah. All right. Are we ready for the next slide or do you want to I see? I think we're ready. I was doing it before. All right. And so um, this is a little bit more on the metadata side of things, but being able to break down our repository content by metadata here. And so the three pieces of metadata that we, we picked out here were visibility, work types, and resource types, and kind of recognizing that people use work types and resource types a little bit differently. I know in Oregon Digital, we use work types the way that resource types are being used here, um, but to be able to understand um, let's say an institutional repository where you might have some things that are public, some things that are IP restricted, um, and, you know, in work types that you might, or in resource types, right, you might have images and documents and, uh, and how those things break down to understand kind of what is the composition um, of a given repository. Um, you know, also recognizing that um, at many places, you know, you, you may not have a divide between a, uh, an institutional and a cultural heritage repository that you have one repository to rule them all and one to bind them, right? Um, so uh, also this used to be one graph um, and kind of more along the lines of the, um, the bigger graph that we looked at earlier with the stacked bar charts. Um, and we ended up splitting this into three to kind of better represent this data here. Um, and April, I wasn't sure um, if there's anything we wanted to add on. We just added that new array of colors to display on these graphs. That's probably the only thing to add. You did a wonderful job, Brandy. Right. 
and collections. So, um, so added this uh, tabbed box of different kinds of collections here. So uh, we didn't have a ton on the staging server here, but I know in Oregon Digital, for example, we have uh, many, <laughs> many collections um, and recognizing that there may be some that you would like to keep uh, an eye on. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and so introducing kind of these pinned collections um, that you can kind of add and, and keep up at the top. So like your flagged email, for example, um, and then also having a tab for just pinned collections as well. Um, so I know, for example, um, you know, we have some that uh, were part of a, uh, a donor uh, initiative. Um, and so those might be some that, hey, we're going to need to provide regular updates on this. So let's go ahead and pin those um, so we can easily get to them. And this is providing a list of um, how many works are associated with those. So, hey, we'd like to have, you know, an update on um, the number of works and files that are associated. All right. So, April, did you want to talk about the um, reports? Actually, I think that was Sarah is going to be Sarah. talking about All right. Report. Um, reports. Okay, so we've um, we've we did not do anything to the statistics link that's left unchanged. Instead, we grouped everything into the analytics tab, which is going to be in your dashboard. Uh, when you click that drop down, you can choose from either collections report or a works report. Um, do you want to switch the the screen the the tab the slide there so we can look at the next report? There we go. Collections report. Um, so we have this broken down into three tabs, a summary, a, a kind of an overall summary of the views of works and the downloads of works, um, as well as top collections. Um, and then if you click on the monthly tab, uh, it gets broken down on a per month, month by month basis for the last 12 months. Uh, or you can click on the custom range tab and set a date and then get the same data for for the custom range. Um, you can also export all of the numbers with the export link. Um, and I believe that's about it for the collections report. Yeah, and um, the number of uh, collections, you'll see the top 10 collections and the information about that. And that is also paginated, so you can kind of click through and see um, all of your collections and the data about it. Um, and then this is where you click through into a collection report and see kind of the data about that specific collection. And um, that collection report has basically the same information. So here's the summary about it. There's a monthly breakdown, and then you can also set a custom range and get that information. And then Margaret, I think if you click through these slides, you'll also see what the monthly report looks like and the custom range looks like. So here's the monthly breakdown, and then that'll just show the last 12 months. Um, and you can see up at the top here, it also says this repository contains three collections, which collectively had had 18 page views and three downloads. And then um, that'll just update over time there. And then the custom range will show on the next slide. There we go. Um, and so, um, and then basically the um, works reports uh, work in exactly the same way um, with the, uh, and if we want to go to the next slide, we can just take a look at that. Oop. And then um, all of these can be exported to CSV. Um, so there's a little export button uh, kind of down at the um, bottom top. I think it's in <laughs> it's in one of the slide shot uh, slide shots there. But um, all of these reports are able to be screenshot or exported, and also with the idea that. Um, you know, many of the graphs and tables can also be um, screenshotted and included in reports looking all nice and pretty. And here's the works report, yes. Um, so likewise with um, pagination, it'll show the top 10 works um, and you can click through for multiple pages and you can also click into an individual work to get more data about it. There's the export button. <laughs> I'm going to chime in real quick here and mention that we made the decision to include the actual ID of your work 
in the reports um, because what's being sent back to the analytics provider, um, as in Google or Matomo, is actually that ID. So when you go to your uh, Matomo dashboard or your Google account, um, the data there is not super useful because you're just going to see these random strings of numbers and letters. Uh, but if you just copy and paste that ID and you can do searches and stuff with that or use that in queries directly in analytics, you'll be able to get a lot more useful information. And one of the things that I really noticed as a as an institutional repository manager um, is kind of differentiating between views and downloads. And so that was another thing that um, I really appreciated um, about this was kind of breaking that out and, ma and making that easier to distinguish. All right. And all right. <laughs> And uh, one thing you might have seen that the title of uh, this presentation changed from uh, when you might have clicked, yes, I want to attend this presentation to when we started here. And um, one of the very exciting things is that this will be hopefully coming soon to a Hyrax release candidate near you. Uh, initially, we were kind of thinking that this might be a gem, uh, but now it will be integrated into Hyrax. So that is something we are very excited about and extremely grateful to our Notch 8 partners. Uh, absolutely none of this would have happened. Uh, without our amazing friends at Notch 8. So thank you so, so much. And I am so sorry we did not leave nearly enough time for questions, uh, but we would be delighted to take um, questions in Slack. And I think we have time for maybe one. <laughs> I think we're running about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. So not oh. to get you off the hook, Franny, but... <laughs> yes, fabulous. All right. I, well, I, I learned if you wait a minute, questions appear. So yes, I will just say yes. selfishly. It takes time to, to enter, to type questions. So I will say um, from the Notch 8 side that Franny and Margaret have been a real joy to work with on this project. And I also thank uh, Crystal Richardson and April Rieger yes. and Sarah Garachi and uh, Braden um, Justice and everybody else from my team that, that helped work with this. It was a lot of fun. Jonathan, um, yes. So we've got, sorry if I missed this, but I'm curious if people already using Matomo are hosting it on premises. I think it's free or using Matomo Cloud. I think it's not free. Do we have any I, Matomo expertise to respond to that? I, I believe Matomo Cloud starts at $29 a month, which I believe is for 50,000 page views. I may be wrong on the number of page reviews, but they they charge um, based on how much usage you're getting, or you can host it yourself for free, which is what Notch 8 did for the development of this project. It was actually pretty easy to do, and then you can set up as many accounts as you'd like and have as many page views as you like. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions coming in? Give it just a few moments. <laughs> 